Hello, and welcome back to the Calm and Connected podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and today I get a chance to speak with Heidi Miller, who is a speech and language pathologist, and she's been practicing speech for over 20 years. And though she's worked in a lot of different settings, including private clinics and hospitals and schools, she found her home in her own practice, and that is located in New Jersey. Um, And not only is she a speech and language pathologist, but she also is married and has three children. And so she also understands things through the parent perspective as well. So on today's podcast, we talk a lot about social skills for kids and some things that we can do as we are seeing them come out of the pandemic and the supports that they might need for that versus if they need more support just in general and lots of other different areas of their life and trying to understand from the parent perspective what are things that we can do to help and support them. So I hope you enjoy our conversation. Heidi, thanks so much for coming on the Common Connected podcast. I'm so excited to be speaking with you today. I'm so excited to be here. It's going to be a great conversation. So for people who don't know you, can you give a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Certainly. I am a speech language pathologist. Um, And as a speech language pathologist, we help children with speech, the way that they articulate sounds, language, the way that they put words together. And a lot of times that also encompasses social skills and social skills are what a person says, how a person says something, when they say it, and picking up on cues of other people. And for some kids, that can be a real challenge. Yes, absolutely. You are speaking my language. I used to work in a social skills clinic, so I understand that. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started recording And I'd love to hear from you what you're noticing in kids now after the pandemic and what what have you been seeing in your work with kids in terms of their social skills? It's been very interesting. The younger children, I would say the two-year-olds, three-year-olds, I have noticed, I'm not a psychologist, but I have noticed like a social anxiety, Um, children really having more challenges interacting with unfamiliar adults, um, interacting with other children. And some of it is within within the norm, but some of it is really, I think, due to lack of exposure. These kids were in their homes. They were told that they sort of need to stay in their homes and be with only familiar people. And it It was a true pandemic. They did have to do that to keep themselves safe. So, you know, this is what they were told and this is what had to happen, but this did not allow for them to have the typical experiences. It didn't allow for them to integrate with so many other people. It didn't allow for them to be in these classroom environments, person to person, or be in the parks and be, and we learn social skills are a skill and we learn skills by practice. And that lack of practice, I have noticed some kids that will come into the clinic for the first time, hiding behind their parents, being a little bit nervous to speak to, I'm an unfamiliar adult the first time they come in. Um, So we are having to really tread a little bit more carefully and do a little bit more teaching. Yes, I am. You know what? That's so interesting, especially from the littler ones, um, because I'm noticing that same thing, too. And, and actually, like even with the bigger kids, just having been remotely schooled and then going back into the building has been has been hard for some of my clients and my kids, you know, like trying to get themselves to be able to walk into the building and talk with other people. And after being told not to get close to people to then it's so, suddenly it's okay to be close again. And then like the, the comfort level around that, the anxiety around that. So interesting to sort of like walk through that with them. Yes. And, you know, I think that adults had it too for a little yeah. while. All of us were at home and then all of a sudden we're like at a party or we're out at a celebration and we're sort of like, what? So imagine the children, you know, with the le- with the less years under their belt, Um So even with my own children, aside from my clients, because I'm a mother of three, 
I would find that when we would be going somewhere that I knew was very concentrated, I'd be like, you know, they're going to ask you what you're doing this summer, you know, remind them that you're going back to camp, you know, you're going to do this. I would sort of feed them some of those questions, some of those things that I think that they're going to be asked about. You're graduating. They're going to ask you about your elementary school graduation. You know, these are the questions that are going to come up and that sort of helps to prepare them and give them some of those responses beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's such power in letting kids be a little bit of get a little preview before you go into something, give them a script before they go in. So they're not sort of like a deer in headlights when somebody asks them about something, because that really is happening a lot more. They're just not used to people asking them stuff, except us, you know, like as their parents, right? Of course, absolutely. Right. And for us, it's it's totally different them speaking to us versus speaking to, um, and then the really little ones, I'll notice they'll leave the clinic and the parents will say, you know, especially for some of the really socially anxious kids, um, make sure you say bye, say bye, say bye, but the child will be waving. And I'll say, mom, a wave is okay. A wave is gestural communication and they're saying goodbye to me. So it's all right. You know, for those younger kids that really, they are fearful of communicating at that time or they're hiding behind you or they're holding on to their sibling in a new environment, a birthday party, a family reunion, a brand new gym class, let them do it. Give them the time to get comfortable. Do not push so, so much. It's going to come. Accept whatever communication they're giving and make it a little easier. You can ask them the yes, no questions. Do you want to go to the slide? Yes or no. They can give you that gestural communication. And that's just as effective until they start to warm up. Now, if this goes on for weeks and weeks and you notice that they are not talking in an in a outside environment, then certainly intervention is helpful. But in the beginning, if there's just like a little shyness, let them observe and find their ground and accept those gestural communications. It's so interesting. I was just talking to Sue Atkins, uh, a parenting expert over in the UK, and she was just talking about the same sort of thing with the pandemic to take it slow, take it easy, baby steps, you know, and getting building up those skills because it does, it does need to be built up if they haven't practiced and to recognize like taking those baby steps of maybe saying yes or no, or nodding or shaking your head and then building up to yes or no out loud and then being able to say goodbye to somebody out loud. It, it is, it's just a process and it's okay to slow it down and give the, make, help make sure that they feel comfortable as they're walking through it, right? Cause it's really hard. It is really hard. And you know, every child is different. You know, you, I have three totally different children and I don't understand it grown up in the same exact house, but totally different. One is completely extroverted, will talk to anybody. And then two are on the shire side. And I clearly am an extrovert, but, but you know, and it's, it's almost hard to parent. Cause I'm like, well, I have a selectively mute child actually, which was very, you know, challenging, but you, it is, it is, they have to sort of learn these skills and also pairing with a familiar person, you know, like if you know that he's in class with Johnny and you know that Johnny, he feels comfortable with Johnny, having them do things together that can build confidence or with a sibling or, yeah. um, I love games too. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I think games are phenomenal. I always say like, I want, I became a therapist because I want to just play games all the time. Games like I are <laughs> awesome. Like, and those little conversation decks, like if you yeah. leave them at the table and like, we're going to do two cards before dinner, because that keeps them on their toes, have them answering random things. I find that to be very, very helpful. Um, that's, a, that's a great resource for parents to be able to just you know, come up with some conversation questions and practice at home. Like that's easy peasy lemon squeezy. Like that's just something you can start practicing just having the conversation at dinner. I think that's a phenomenal idea. Yeah, that is one. And also like if they do have a little friend over, like jumping in for five minutes, like let's pull some cards, you know, yeah. so that they're used to doing it without you, with somebody else. Um, 
And in the lunchbox, sometimes for that middle one of mine, I used to throw in a conversation starter. Like, you know, we went to see this movie over the weekend. Tell your friends about it or ask your friend about his sister's party. I know it was her birthday. Like he knew how to read and I knew that he had trouble initiating. It was tough for him. So giving a little bit of a push, nobody was reading his napkin in his lunchbox, but it just kind of gave an idea. Yeah. Um, so the things we're talking about now are more like social anxiety, social things. But there are some kids that have true pragmatic disorders. And that's different, right? That yes. kind of intervention, sort of like what you were saying when you did social groups. There are some kids that are totally mainstream, for lack of better words, whatever that means. But they can benefit. Everybody can always benefit from groups, right? Yeah. But there also can be in our world, there can be kids that have a language deficit, which is difficulty putting thoughts together, understanding incoming language. And then you can have something that we refer to as a pragmatic disorder. And that's something a little bit different. That's when a child has difficulty interpreting the tone of what somebody else is saying. They tend to take things very literally. Um, they don't always stay on topic. Um, they have difficulty with the turn-taking aspect of conversation. Um, they sometimes will invade personal space because they don't always understand those boundaries. They don't always recognize to change who they're talking to. In other words, you would talk to your sibling or a family member different than you would talk to a teacher or a principal. So these are some aspects of children that might have a true pragmatic disorder, and they might need a little bit more of a push than some of these activities that we're talking about just to sort of boost your child. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting and helpful um sort of in, information for parents to know that there is this like differentiation between like maybe they're having some challenges from the pandemic and challenging challenges getting back into the world but they just need a little bit of a boost versus kids who really do have more of a deficit and need more skill building so how should parents how could parents know the difference between that like how do you know when it's just like oh it's just the pandemic or there's more to it is there any uh do you have any ideas on that for families that's a great question i think that parents know their kids you know um the pragmatic portion that we were talking about where there's more of a pragmatic disorder the children tend to not pick up on cues so much and that's going to happen in the home and outside of the home in other words in the home they're also not going to be able to maintain topic or they're just going to start a story without telling you the beginning of the story and give you an idea of where they're coming from um or they're going to speak and maybe if you don't understand something, they're not gonna recognize, ah, I think that I'm losing her and go back and explain. So that's gonna happen in the natural environment and, and outside. If you have a child that's like more like what we were talking about first, maybe like right a social anxiety or nervousness because of pandemic, their social skills within the home env environment I, are gonna present more naturally. Do you, do you? Yeah, absolutely. I would totally agree. If they are with familiar people, people that they've been around for a really long time, they feel comfortable with, um, people that they live with or like a tr another trusted adult. And if they're looking real good in those spaces, but then they go out someplace else and they're like, ah, that's a different situation than a kid where it, uh, it affects everywhere. Like it doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> exactly. Because if it's a deficit, if you don't have it, you're not going to have it in any environment. Right. If you have it at home where you're really comfortable and then you go out and it's around these people you don't know and you haven't been out and you've been isolated, that's where, and look, there are some children, like when I had shared that personal experience before with my son with selective mutism, 
there are kids, I mean, he did not speak in his preschool and certainly I seek the help of a psychologist, not a speech pathologist, because as a speech therapist, I knew he could speak fine. There wasn't a problem there. It was stemming from an, from an, a place of anxiety. So we needed to work on that. So it's um, so right. So that's essentially, I think the main differential. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great um, explanation for family. So they understand, like, if you, you have to, you know, like as a mom, uh, we know we're paying attention, we're noticing. And if you're hearing this from other places, but you're not seeing this, or you're noticing when, when you're out and you're going out into places, or you're hearing this from the teacher, but you're not seeing it at home, that's a different sort of situation. I mean, you still have to deal with it and help right. support it. And, but it's, it's sort of a different, lens that you can look through and figure out, okay, well, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? If that makes sense. Certainly. Absolutely. So I, you know, it's so interesting to me. Do you, do you, um, you mentioned games earlier. Do you do a lot of games when you are working with kids in your clinic? Absolutely. Love games. (laughs) <laughs> we do so many of them. We do some games that are just simple, like turn taking something as easy as like, a, you know, a connect four, my turn, your turn, just to teach the turn taking. Um, headbands will do um, for describing. But, and I love those, com- I do a ton of conversation cards. You know, I have like every kind from every place. Um, and then but, so yes, I we there there's no game that we don't play. Candy, I, we we play everything. That's um, awesome. And a lot of pretend play, a lot of puppets, a lot of role playing. Um, the diner will use because we can teach social skills through that. So I use the diner all the time. What would you like? Do you like it? How is it? I have puppets. The puppet will fall on the floor. What are you going to ask the puppet? Are you okay? Can I get you anything? So that's a way also of infusing um, social skills. And with some of the children that have challenges with eye contact and which I don't force, um, but I would like, I like for somebody to like gently look. So I will, you know, use a puppet because it's, it's less stressful. I have one child who doesn't necessarily have a pragmatic situation, but she is very, very anxious, but she is apraxia. So for apraxia, she needs to be looking at my mouth for the modeling of the speech. Her mom comes in and she will look at her mom. So I have her mom model because, you know, it's so it really is so interesting. So a lot of those symbolic play things I also find to be tremendously helpful because the child doesn't feel like we're then like talking at them. We're sort of talking at the toys. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I think you bring up such a point that I love to emphasize all the time is that play is the natural way you can see social skills. So like you use it in your work when you're working in, in speech and language. I use it in my work when I'm talking with kids about their feelings and their emotions and their thoughts and what's going on. And it's the way that they speak, you know, like kids can talk through their problems in a sand tray or talk through what's going on and pretend play. It's so powerful. And so I love that you are doing this in your work. And I love your example um, because what you are doing then is you're also like have bridging that to home as well. So are there things that you would recommend for families to do in terms of playing games um, that would help build on social skills? Certainly. Um, Like I've said, I love those conversation cards, but this symbolic play, maybe have a stuffed animal or a puppet. Um, It doesn't have, you don't have to go out and get a puppet. A lot of people have already animals and things like that in their house and designate one as a buddy and take that one animal and have it be like in your mind, your social skills buddy, but have your child name it if it's not named already and use him as your model because it's there's not always an extra person there and repetition is key. So let's say we have our puppet and we name him Bo. And so keep Bo in a fairly central place. So this way, when you walk in from school, 
hi, Bo. And then your child, hi, Bo, when you're leaving, bye, Bo. So there we're doing greetings. If Bo falls down, oh no, Bo, are you okay? This way, these things end up translating. And your child, then when you see it in real life, let's say we then now are outside, we're at the park, a little boy falls down, mom can model, oh no, are you okay? And this is how the children are going to sort of learn these kinds of skills. And it just builds in some extra opportunities there. Um, so those are for the younger kids, the older kids, like I said, really trying to anticipate what's to come for them. Um, and all different kids like all different things. So you certainly want to keep in mind what your child, like what your child likes and what interests your child and who your child is with so that you can feed them or assist them with appropriate information. Um, so like if you have a child that's say very sporty and you know that he hangs out with sporty kids, you can be like, Hey, remember the Rangers game was on, even though they just lost, but you know, the Rangers playoff game was on and they lost. It's something that you can mention. And then if you have a child that has no interest in sports, you know, you can say, Hey, you know, the new Top Gun movie just came out. Like see, see if whatever it is, just to sort of feed them conversation pieces, you know, um, because I do think that that can, it just eases it for them so that when they're feeling really stuck, it gives them something to talk about and to bridge. Yes. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And I also during family meals, I'm a huge family meal advocate and I know it's really, really hard, but at least a couple times a week to be able to sit down and go over what was the best part of your day? What was the hardest part of your day? Like what, because those exchanges really help to teach. Yes, absolutely. I, we used to do roses and thorns. Um, so they'd come off the bus and they'd be like, this is my rose. Or I remember what very vividly one day my son came off the bus and he's like, I had a thorn. <laughs> So, you know what, he's communicating to me, like something really went sideways at school and I really wow. need to talk about it. But he had that like framework of, we have this discussion and he, he knew like, it's a conversation we have all the time. They were littler at the time they were in elementary school, but still to this day, they come home from middle school and they'll tell me, they tell me wow. all the stuff they're like, and then guess what happened? And then mm -hmm. this happened. And then we had a fire drill and then this person was not paying attention this guy was like oh it's just you get all the information but it's beginning to build those connections and that's what I really keep hearing from you is that building those conversation skills building those connections not only does it start at home but we can help bridge that for them at school bridge that for them oh, in different sure. places so that they get comfortable in knowing how to have how to start those conversations. What do you do when, you're, when you just need to make a little bit of small talk when you're sitting at the lunch table? Yeah. You, you start talking about all the sports teams around here. So right now we're all about the Celtics. We're all about the US oh, Open. Was, you know? the Celtics just, did they just lose? The, tonight's game five. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> but they did just lose last week. All right. Yeah, we won't get into it. it. My husband's from Boston. He does love the Celtics, but my son. All right. So yes. <laughs> But you're right. And also, you know, when they're smaller, you pick it up. But as you know, as the children grow, like I have the middle school also and high school, it's, yeah. it continues. And as parents, we are still guiding the ship and helping them and maintaining those open communications are, it's very important um, because the problems kind of start to get bigger <laughs> they, they get bigger and the, and navigating that social stuff yeah. really does can, it, it is always evolving so having a very strong foundation is super important and you know my husband will also say who cares that this one is introverted he has a different social social measurement than you have like you need more he needs less he's happy which is true, you know, but um, it is, it's always evolving and it's always changing. So the more that we can support them, these are foundation skills that they need to know how to have. They need to be able to go, do good listening. They need to be able to understand the topic and kind of follow along. And, 
And sometimes you have to listen about something you really don't understand and you're not interested in, but you have to be a listener. Yep, absolutely. And, I, you know, as parents, I think we practice that as well. Like sometimes we don't want to necessarily hear about Minecraft or your build. Exactly. And I, we don't want to hear about your video game necessarily. But I will always say, yes, I half the time I have no idea what my children are talking about when they talk to me about a video game. Like seriously, no idea. I, I have a video game lover and a sports lover. I get, I understand exactly. Right. And so, but I'm, but I listen and I try to ask smart questions and I'm paying mm -hmm. attention, right? Because I want them to know your interest. Like I understand, I love you and I want to hear what you were interested in. And then when it's my turn, I will tell you what I'm interested in. And I'm going to expect you to do a little bit of reciprocating, but it's just, it's good practice, but it also means that we're connecting and that it's, I'm showing that I care. I'm showing that I'm listening. And so then when a bigger problem comes along, they feel more comfortable to be like somebody offered me drugs at school or somebody was doing something that made me feel right, uncomfortable. Or somebody was drinking and they offered to drive and I said, no, I have to call you. Exactly. Right. But want to know what I love? I love then when they'll come to me and be like, how was work today, mommy? Did you have any interesting cases? Or like my, my middle one who cares about money, he'll be like, did you have a good month? <laughs> you know? And like... <laughs> Um, they see I work so hard, you know, but yeah. what's crazy is then it comes back around and I'm like, Landon, thank you so much for caring. That was so nice of you. And yes, I had a great day. I saw a lot of interesting kids. So it's it, giving them that compliment and that reinsurance of, wow, like you're getting it and you you're picking it up, even though it was, a, it is a challenge for you. My middle one, my youngest, it comes natural. Yeah. But my other ones, not always. So the fact that, you know, when you see that they've kind of learned it and they're getting it and they're reciprocating it, it's awesome. Right. And then also- Because we can teach it. Right, exactly. And what's interesting too, you mentioned you have like a couple that are introverted, maybe one that's more extroverted, mm -hmm. you know, like to respect that that is how they work. And to know that the introverts are going to need some downtime to recharge and the extroverts are going to need some people time to recharge. And so to understand that balance and to honor that for each of them to know, like, yes, you need some time just chilling out after school in your room. I get it. And when you're ready, I'll be here and we can have a snack and we can chat. The other one who's like, let's go out and let's find a, let's find people. Let's go to the exactly. library. Let's go I, to the I park. Know where she is. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I do, but I don't, you know. Yep. Mm -hmm. I completely understand. We are totally on the same page. Right. Um, really interesting. Oh my gosh. Is there anything else that you want to share with parents? Any other tips or tricks that you have that you, you just die to share? I feel like we covered a lot of territory in this conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that what is very important is that if you do feel that your child might have some kind of a pragmatic disorder, the way that we had talked about before, there's help. Um, therapists can help. And those social groups are awesome. Um, they really make a very big difference. And parents can help too. So if you did hear something in this conversation that got you thinking and made you a little bit worried or nervous it it children have infinite potential and the reason why we call it a skill like i said before is because it's learned and there are ways of teaching kids how to learn these things so i think that that's a really important takeaway yeah to know that it is just because you're seeing something doesn't mean it's always going to have to be that way and you can build a skill you can work on a skill and it can get better over time right. um so one more thing that i always love to ask all of my guests what's a way that you like to rest and recharge or what's one of your coping skills that you want to share i am a binge tv watcher when i have the time I veg out to some kind of a show and I just go. I don't always have time to do it. That probably is my one. And then my second is, as we said, I'm extroverted and I do love spending time with friends and family, but I like to go out. But binge watching probably at home is very good decompression for me. 
Oh my gosh. Do you have any like shows that are must watch? Like I, I have gone through so many. I couldn't even tell you right now I'm on all American because my sons used to watch with me and they stopped. So like, they like, it's not that they stopped. They wouldn't go as fast as I would because they always got involved with other stuff. And I'm like, I'm done with you now. Like now I'm just moving on. You know, um, I have shows that I watch with my husband for like our time together, like Bosch we will do together. Um, I, I have gone through so many, I can't even count. But right now, this second, I'm doing all American. That's my binge, of, my binge of the minute. Oh my goodness. I totally understand. I have like all of the like different sort of like Roku. I have my Roku and I have like Netflix and I have Amazon Prime and I have Britbox yeah. and I have Acorn. And that is like my, I love to decompress at the end of a day. Like it just breaks my brain shut off. That's how I feel. And so I can actually like, if it's, I need to like, ha it has to be good though. Like I want drama. I want like, I want something to like bite into so I can just like shut off and focus. And it's amazing. We just finished. We just finished something that was so good. Oh, you know what? We pulled it back from, it was some female detective. It was on something like, what was it on? We found it some random thing. Oh, I found it. And then he started watching it with me, which was annoying because he slows me down. Like I said, but it was some girl, like she was like a female FBI agent. But like what I loved about it was that it kind of built on each other. But at the end of every episode, like they got the case, like they they figured it out. So it was I can't believe I can't think of it now. But it was right. so good. yeah, I love I love. But I go I do it all like I do the trash, too. You know, the <laughs> real house. I, nice. yeah. I mean, I'm all over the place. I, I'm all over the place. I get it. I totally get it. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for coming on. If Love people want to learn more about you, if they want to learn more about your work and your practices, where should they go? Um, oh my goodness. Hold on. I'm sorry. That's all right. I should know my TikToks and everything like that. You would think that I would. I think TikTok I'm, is. People ask me all the time and I never know. <laughs> I'm like terrible. Okay. I'm looking. Why can't I see what? Okay. They can find us at HMS. Wait a minute. Sorry. Again. All right. <laughs> I just, you know what? Because everything just changed. Yeah, TikTok exactly. Is, right. It's HMS. Okay. Our clinic is HMS and Associates, and that is at HeidiMillerSpeech.com. They can find us on TikTok at HMS Speech and Feeding, and our Instagram is also HeidiMillerSpeech.com. Okay, and we'll link to those in the show notes for everybody. Sounds Heidi, great. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for chatting. I'm so excited that we were able to get together and have this conversation. And everybody listening, don't forget about yourself. Take a few minutes, have a little fun, and have an awesome day. I loved this. Thank you. <laughs>